All right, good morning. This is Sunday School. It is February 28th, 2021. If you have your Bibles, please turn to the book of Acts in chapter number 21. <clears throat> the approach of the Apostle Paul in the book of Acts, uh, it, it seems sometimes that he's, he's, uh, he's contradicting himself, where he says, like, okay, from henceforth, no more am I going to go to the Gentiles. You know, you, your blood be on your own head. I am clean, clean from all men. And then what happens? Well, just kidding. I, I really, if it was all possible, by all means, I'd love to go and keep the feast that's coming at Jerusalem, right? I want to be clear that the reason why he does that is because he has that great heaviness. He has that continual spiritual mindset about seeking and saving the lost. He wants all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. One of the biggest testimonies to your own justification, your own salvation, the fact that you, you are sealed as a member of the body of Christ, that you do have the Holy Spirit, is immediately when you say, oh, but what about, and you fill in the blank, my brother, my father, my mother, my friend, Sam, Billy, Johnny, Sarah, whatever it is, you start filling the blank of all these people because now you're thinking about their spiritual state, right? I had a discussion this week with a guy, and he was pretty sad, and he says, yeah, man, this... Uh, you know, this relationship with this girl is not working out. I said, really? It's, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that. I thought you really, really liked her and thought it was going good. He goes, yeah, you know, I thought it was going good. And then we really got into the Bible and, and uh, started getting into things. And she just said, you know, I'm just, I just don't really like religion. He said, well, I don't really like religion either. And, you know, it's not, it's not the, you know, that's religion is bad. And he starts getting into the reasons why, you know, the, the concepts of denominationalism and everything. And, you know, the girl just said, you know, it's just, it's just that, you know, so many people are hypocritical and, and it's just, it's unfortunate that, the life of a person that is a member of the body of Christ sometimes, right, can impact whether or not a person will believe the gospel, right? It's sad. It's sad to think, think like, well, you do this or you say that. My response to that is, like Russ always says, well, they're always hypocrites. Well, come join us. We can always use one more, right? You know, I mean, like, you're going to be any better, right? In other words, why don't we just take a realistic approach to life and understand that the, that the old man is the old man. He always will and always will be. So, you know, the Apostle Paul here in Acts chapter 21, I think it's important to know that in Acts 18, he was there in Ephesus. He was at Corinth for a year and a half, if you remember, in Acts chapter 18. And in Acts chapter um, uh, um, 19, he's there in Asia for the period of about two years. And he says, all they in Asia had heard the word of the gospel and believed. I, I, I think about Russ a lot of times throughout the week. I don't know, maybe because it's just a lot of doctrine that he's taught me and things. But one of the things I remember he said early on, is he says, well, get a list. Get a list going. Get out a piece of paper, get out a note card, and, and create a list. A list of all the people at, that might need the gospel, right? And I was, I was like, man, that's kind of weird, but I mean, it's not a bad idea, right? So it's like, these are the people that I need to get. So I was driving up this week, same thing. We started getting into another Bible discussion. We had 45 minutes, and you're stuck in the car with me. Well, what are we going to do? We're going to start going down that path. I think as you kind of slowly plant that seed, I, I use the Tiger Woods example, you know, because, you know, he got in that horrible car accident. I mean, you think he woke up that day and decided he was going to get in a car accident? No, of course not, right? It's the same thing with Kobe Bryant and the rest of the guys. The life, life is short. It's very, very quick. And, and that, that spiritual mindset, you know what it does? It gives you so much more peace because of this. The, the, the Christ says, which one of you, by taking thought for the morrow, can add one cubit unto your stature, right? Which one of you, by taking thought for the morrow, can add one cubit to a stature. You can't, right? But the world teaches you, okay, you, 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 need, you need to focus on this and, and retirement. And, th and they go down this whole long list of things that you need to worry about. And they're going to give you one more every day on the evening news. If you have a spiritual mindset, in the discussion I had with my friend and his girlfriend in the car, I said, you know, really this higher form of, of spiritual mindset is really a form of enlightenment. And they both like that. They're like, really? Because they're kind of a little new agey. And so I kind of said, yeah, the spiritual mindset is a form of enlightenment. It's freeing. It's liberating. You want to get to true nirvana, if you would? I mean, this is nirvana. This is it. And it's if you can take those words, as opposed to some people who would say things like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm very anti that. No, you, you saw how it is? So what, what I'm trying to get to is that in Paul and his approach, he becomes all things to all men that by all means he might save some. And I look at my life and go, how can I do that on a daily basis? I really do. I really go, okay, how can I, how can I better approach this scenario? I'm looking at it like a, like a tactician. I'm, I'm over there like a sniper trying to figure out, okay, how can I, how am I going to approach this gospel message? 
without trying to add the wisdom of men to it and try to make it you know, more convoluted, but at the same time, take this person at where they are in their life and the words that they've told me and use that. And people say, well, you just need to preach the gospel. You just say, Christ died for your sins, and that's it, and you're done. You can do that, right? But what Paul does, as we know, he says here in, in Acts chapter 18 that he, he himself enters into the synagogues and he reasons with the Jews. He reasons with them, right? A reasoning is, is a twofold approach. It's not only that you just give them facts, right? And you tell them information that is supposedly truth, but that you take them where they are. In other words, you take them from an emotional standpoint that this is something that they've held on to for a very long time. You do not try to make them feel stupid or, or make them feel like they're, they're uh, you know, an idiot, if you would, for, for believing this. But what you do with that information is you reason with them by using the God-given intellect that they possess and the, the deductive reasoning that we all have. We do it every day. We make deductive reasoning. So I like how Paul, of course, uses that example of, I become all things to all men that I might by all means save some. When he's here in Acts chapter number 18, he does a similar thing. If you read here in verse 18, I want to show you these verses because we, we, we got to go back to 21 and tell you why he's telling everybody to uh, not, not to observe these things and whether or not what happens. I'm going to get to a climax today. There's going to be a point in which I say something, and I hope you guys go, wow, right? That's what I'm hoping I get to today. Okay? All right, look at 18, 18. Uh, and Paul, after this, tarried there yet a good while, and then took his leave of the brethren, and sailed thence into Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila, having shorn his head in Centria, for he had a vow, and he came to Ephesus and left them there, but he himself entered into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they desired him to tarry longer time, okay, they wanted him to stay longer, he consented not, but bade them farewell, saying, I must by all means keep this feast that cometh in Jerusalem. Now, why is he going to keep a feast? Does not Paul say that there is no respect of days anymore? We don't look at days. There's no holy day. Every day is a holy day. Is there anything that's not clean that we can eat anymore, right? Even the stuff that's offered to an idol, who cares? The only way it becomes anything powerful is when you say it's offered to an idol. Other than that, just eat it. Don't, just, don't even worry about it. Just eat it, right? Just eat the food. Bless it and move on, right? The only way you give power to the idol is when you try to think that it has some power that it doesn't actually possess. Same thing goes with this feast or these holy days. They were all what? Types, pictures, foreshadowings, all things that lead us to ultimately what? A picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. So if Paul, in here in, in, in chapter number 18, shorns his head in Centria and he has a vow... Why is he doing that? I like how actually, if you read what uh, Schofield says here, he goes, the author of Romans 6, 14, 2 Corinthians 3, and Galatians 3 takes a Jewish vow, right? He's freaking out. He's going, why is he doing that? Well, I think we all know. Go back over to 1 Corinthians for me in chapter number 9. I'm going to start in verse number 7, okay? Who goeth a warfare any time at his own charges? What is he getting into? Who declares war? Does anybody know? Is it the president? Is it Congress? It should be Congress. <laughs> right. But, but what happens? We're going to war, right? We're just going to do it, right? So what has to happen is this. President can send them. What does Congress, what is, what does Congress have to do? It has to ratify what the president says and say they have to go, right? So if you remember the 9-11 attacks, when all that stuff went down, right? Bush is like, round them up, send them out. We are going, right? And then Congress comes back and says, okay, yeah, we approve of the, you know, there's this thing called the USMJ, and there's military forces and all these crazy, there's, there's rules of, of war, right? You can't just go at your own charges. You have to go by, by being sent. So as we look at Paul says here, he says, Who goeth a warfare any time at his own charges? Who planteth a vineyard and eateth not of the fruit thereof? Or who feedeth a flock and eateth not of the milk of the flock? Say I these things as a man? 
or saith not the law also? For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth God take care for the oxen? Or saith he altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he that ploweth should plow in hope, and he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. Verse 11. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? Right? When Paul was addicted and dedicated to the ministry, he says, I, 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 I didn't want to be chargeable to any of you. I didn't want to come in here and you think I made gain of you. I didn't want to create any issues. Now compare this with the spiritual, uh, 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 the nation of Israel who is, in a sense, were the spiritual people, the ones who did believe who Christ was, who sold their possessions in the very beginning, who divested everything that they had, who early on in the book of Acts, they became the poor saints at Jerusalem, right? And they lived there thinking, okay, kingdom's coming, kingdom's coming. Then all these Gentiles who receive all the spiritual blessings that the nation of Israel could have had, namely that they're called the children of God, right? Gentiles are being called the children of God, right? Wow. That's going to make the Jews a little bit jealous, and of course they're, going to, they're not too happy about that. But you get to a point where he says that it, it, is, it is your duty, right, if you, meaning Gentiles, partook in the spiritual things that they have, and we're going to get into what that means, that you should benefit them or help them in the carnal nature, right? You should. You should always. As much as you have the ability to do good unto men, what should you do? Yeah. You go and you do it. You, you make that happen. So Paul, here in verse 11, says, if we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing that we shall reap your carnal things? If others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather? Nevertheless, we have not used this power, but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. He says, I would rather not have anything that gets in a hurdle between the gospel. Remember I said before that people will call you a hypocrite, or they'll call you that you have ulterior motives, that they want you to come to church and, and give money, right? That's probably one of the number one things that I hear when I say, you know, about inviting somebody to church or do you go to church? No, they're just money grubbers or they just, well, they just want your money. And you're like, it's amazing when I say, yeah, I agree. They look at you like, wait, what do you mean? Do you ever realize, like in our group especially, since we're, you know, anti this, this the fake false religion, that we have an immediate acceptation of what we say because of the nature of our agreement together in a disagreement about what the church is doing, the, the bigger picture, right? We immediately say the church is, is doing a bunch of dumb things. We were driving down the street, as I said, with my two friends in the car. They're both in the front seat and I had a thousand shrimp in the back seat. And we're sitting there and we're talking and I said, what's this church? An Episcopal church. What's that? What does that mean? Have any ideas? How about this one? The Good Shepherd Lutheran. What does that mean? Anybody know? And I looked at him and the girl's like, idea. I go, well, why do, they ha why do we have another one? And then I was just, how about this one? We're just driving up a street. And I go, hey, there's another one. There's another one. Oh, there's another one. Look at all these churches. This is crazy. What are they doing? And I did that because I want them to kind of know, like, I don't just walk into that place and go, yeah, that place is good, right? That place is great. They're going to give you lots of good information. So in, in Paul's thing, the one thing that I like, I like about what he gets into is that his, his mindset about the ministry was one, as he says here, he thought about it from a reward perspective, okay? It is very important that you also think about the ministry from a reward perspective. Incentivization for why you're doing something gives you what? Motivation. Well, what's your motivation? Well, I just want to I just want to do it. No, you want to do it because you ultimately want to receive the reward. You want, to, and, and this gets into the judgment seat. This is why Paul does what he does, and, and, and I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me just let me keep going in verse 12. He's at verse 13. He says, Do you not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple, and they which wait at the altar are the partakers of the altar? Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live the gospel. But I have used none of these things, neither have I written these things, that it should be done so unto me, for it were better for me to die than that any man should make my glorying void. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. When Paul says, 
what is, basically he's going to answer the question in a second, but what is the reward that he gets? When he says, for, for if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. Is he just talking about the judgment seat of Christ? Paul, Paul, has a, Paul talks about this phrase multiple times. He uses the, 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 the word account. Account. You ever seen the little pictures where it's like, I'm too afraid to look at my account. I'm too afraid <laughs> to log in. I, 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 listen, I, I do decently well, and there's times where I go, I don't even want to log in and look at my account. I don't want to, my TD Ameritrade account, I heard the, 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 the stock market crash and had all these problems. Like, I don't even want to look at it. I don't, I don't want to log in, and I don't want to even look at it, right? But, you know, I, I do, and I log in, and I look at my account. The account that we have with God is a record. Okay? It's a record. One of the things that we get to do is we can have fruit and benefit to others' accounts, that I might abound to your account. If you start thinking about it that way, you're like, wow, what am I doing? How am I treasuring up in my account? Am I treasuring up in the account people? Notice that. Think about that. That I can, remember what he says, that, that I can present, that we can present the church to God? He says that in Romans chapter 15, that I can present them to Christ. The presentation only happens even for us today because of the faithful ministry of the Apostle Paul. Think about this. The reason I'm in this pulpit is because the Apostle Paul taught Timothy. Follow me? And then Timothy found faithful men, and he found and instructed these guys and he said you find other faithful men and commit the same to them and they shall be able to go out and teach others also does it work hey apparently it does because we're still doing it right remember what Gamaliel said Gamaliel said if this was not if this was not of God just leave it alone what will it do it'll just disappear okay so one of the one of the wise men that taught the Apostle Paul by his own mouth, agreed that the Apostle Paul was right, that he did have the truth, that he did have the right doctrine. So what is the reward then? Well, Paul says, verily, really his reward is that he might gain the more. Okay? He was always looking for gain. You should look for gain too. What should you look for your gain in? People. People. Read what he says. What is my reward? Verily, that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge. In other words, he says, I want to preach the gospel to you freely. Do people do that today? No. Yeah. I read a Tim Keller quote this morning, and I'm like, this guy's off his rocker. They all are. You're, I'm not they all are. I shouldn't say that. That's, that's, that's a little ridiculous. But many of them are. Tim Kohler's quote says, you can't just, you know, believing the gospel is not enough. You need to also experience it in your heart. And I go, what does that mean? What does experience it in your heart mean? As we've all read the book by Fink on Lordship Salvation, that's what they do. They love to create a little bit of, oh, you have to experience this. Ooh, have I experienced this? Do I even know what that is? And it becomes something that they can hold over you and tell you, you probably haven't experienced it. And since you haven't experienced it, maybe you're really not saved. And you should probably come back in our church, because if you're not in our church, then you're probably definitely not saved. If you're not giving the money, then you're definitely not saved. And if you're not attending our programs and buying our stuff, then you're definitely not saved. Paul says, though I be free from all men, yet I have made myself servant unto all. This is very important. Notice what he says. He makes himself the servant unto all. He says, I'm going to do this because this is what God has instructed me to do. He says, I'm free. But I want to make myself a servant that I might gain the more. And in verse number 20, this is it. This is, this is what he's doing. I, I see no other reason to, to, to say that he's still being a Jew. Okay? People are like, oh, he's, Paul was still doing all the Jewish things because he thought he was a Jew. No, he tells you to not to keep the feast like the old days, right, with the unleavened bread and all that stuff, what do you keep the feast with today? In sincerity and in what? And in truth. Maybe you guys are not familiar with these verses. We'll look at them in just a second. Paul says this, And unto the Jews I became as a Jew. Do we have record of that, that we've been reading? 
Yes, we just read it again in Acts chapter number 18, that he shorn his head in Centria when he was with Priscilla and Aquila. He has the vow. He goes into the synagogue. He reasons with them. He says, by all means, he wants to keep the feast that cometh in Jerusalem. Think about this. If he really, if he goes, the feast is nothing. Everything's stupid. You guys are all a bunch of idiots for doing this. Christ has fulfilled all the law. Do you think he's ever going to get anywhere with those guys? They would just be like, off with your head. We want nothing to do with you, right? But when you are, as I said, the tactician, when you are tactfully going through this, and you know how to, as Paul says, I may know how to answer every man, right? There's a way that you answer every man. You ought to answer them in a specific way. You don't answer them in the same way. You don't deal with the drunk, right, the same way you deal with the intellectual. You don't deal with the, the, the prisoner the same way you deal with the lawyer. Yes, they're all on even playing ground, but there's different approaches to each one of those individuals to make the gospel be most beneficial to them. And unto the Jews I became a Jew that I might gain the Jews to them that are under the law. Notice this. To them that are under the law as under the law. What does he do? He will act like he is under the law for a little bit of time to say, okay, fine, I'll, I'll, I'll partake in this. I'll act like I'm underneath the law. What do you think they're doing there at Pentecost? Law. That's what it is. Now, somebody have asked me about this verse, and they said, well, I don't understand what he says by this. Notice this. He says, And unto the Jews I became a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law. And they say, well, what do you mean, those that are without law? Well, this is very, very easy. Okay. Gentiles have never had the law of Moses. That was never their covenant. That was never their promise. It'll never be their covenant. It'll never be their promise. Okay? No circumcision. no circumcision. Doesn't happen. They don't get it. Now, this is the question that people have. They go, but it says, but, but not without law to God. Right? What do you mean? Everybody has a law that's ingrained in their hearts. There's a, there's a Noahic law that is there from your conscience that you're never going to get rid of. People are like, a Noahic law? What do you mean? Yeah, you never read about the Noahic laws? They're, they exist before the Mosaic laws, okay? You think murder was always wrong? Yeah, ask Adam and Eve. They knew about it. They knew it was wrong, okay? You think they knew lying was wrong? Yes. So when you read these verses where he says, not without law to God, no man is without law to God, okay? Paul says where there is no law, sin is not what? Imputed. So Romans 3.19 is probably the only verse you need on this subject because he says, whatsoever things the law saith, it does say to them that are under the law, so that would be the nation of Israel. But every mouth is going to be stopped underneath that law. Stop meaning trying to say, I did this, or I did that, or I was good, or I was whatever. And that the whole world, and world does mean everybody, would be guilty. I think I've said it. I'll say it again. If people are instructed, meaning the Jews, are instructed out of the law, if the nation of Israel is instructed out of it, and they do not keep it, and they're taught it day in and day out, and they, and they hide God's word in thine heart that they might not sin against thee, and they bind it upon themselves, and they do it, they meditate on it day and night, right? And they still don't keep it? What do you think a Gentile is going to do? The world becomes guilty before God. That's it. So, when Paul here in Acts chapter 18, 19, and 20, and 21 is, are, is doing things that you think are Jewish, you go, well, he's, he's still being a Jew because he still believes those things are necessary. Come on, that's not true. Okay? Just what we read there from what those three verses, you know, when, when Schofield says the, the writer of Galatians 3 and Romans 6 and writes this, come on. He's obviously doing that because he's, he's, he's fulfilling what he says, that I might become a Jew to those under the Jew that I might gain the Jews, to them that are under the law as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. Verse 22, or verse 21, to them that are without law as without law, that I might gain them that are without law, in parentheses, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law to the weak, Became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means 
then I might by all means save some. They say that you know when the Navy SEALs are doing their training, okay, and they are so exhausted and they feel like they've given it all, they've only normally given about 40%. Yeah, you've only given 40%. You have that much more left in you. And then when they feel like they're absolutely exhausted and they think they're going to die, you're at about 70%. You still have 30% more to give. And I'm just thinking to myself, I'm like, wow, what point in time? And, I, and, I, and I'll tell you, I, the last four days I spent fishing literally 14, 15 hours, right, every day, okay? And my one buddy goes, man, how are you doing that four days in a row? You've got to be exhausted. I said, yeah, I'm tired, but I can sleep, I can sleep on Sunday afternoon. I'm going to do that, you know? I said, I got, I got a set time. I got a nap schedule set up, ready? But that, that time of going and going and going, you're not thinking about that tiredness. You're just, you're just persevering and you're going on. Can you say in your mind, truthfully, that you have by all means done everything? Hmm. That's a lot. You know, the Holy Spirit does a, a, does a good work, does he not? <laughs> what does the Holy Spirit do in your life? My life? Oh, man. I'm ruined. I, I say it every week, but it's so stinking true. I'm ruined in a good way in which I look at things differently. I'm always getting that renewed sense of, you know, urgency about the gospel message. And I think to myself, okay, how can I, by all means, save some? Okay, obviously we know. God gives the increase. We are just fellow laborers together with God. The examples that we get in the scripture of Paul doing what he does is to show you that he doesn't care. He would go to Jerusalem. He's ready to not only be bound, but he's also ready to die for another, right? No greater love hath a man than he does what? And he lay down his life for his friends, okay? That's why he says in Romans chapter 9, I wish myself could be accursed, right? I wish myself could be accursed for, for my, fellow, my fellow kinsmen after the flesh, and he says, in this I do, notice this, this is important, verse 22, to the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I have made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some, and this, and this I do for the gospel's sake, okay? What is, what is the gospel's sake? Notice this, and this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. There's something that he gets. There's something that he gets in the giving of the gospel? I thought it was all just get, giving, giving, giving. Now, look at this. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? What is the issue here that Paul is getting to? When he was saying, when he's preaching the gospel, there was issues of, of, of people benefiting, obviously, from it, right? Financially, pecuniary. That's always the issue. The love of money is the root of all evil. <laughs> If you don't believe that, let me, let me take you to my client's offices for a day, okay? We'll show you some real evil stuff going on. They follow that money and they love it so much, they just they don't, they don't care about anything else. And I go, do you guys just not look at the end of that? What, is it, what does it matter? Oh, you have $20 million. Great, now what? Don't you ever think you should do something with that? Is it just hoarding it away in a bank account and your savings and your retirement accounts and your stock market accounts and your portfolios and your real estate? What's it do for you? You could be like Tiger Woods, flip your car, and you almost die in an instant. You could be like Kobe Bryant, you're in the helicopter and you die. Yeah, you know, it just happens that quickly. So don't you want to? Don't you want to? In other words, redeem the time. Paul says here, "Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that ye may obtain." And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I mean, Paul talks to you about this in the book of Colossians. You guys know these verses. Go over to the book of Colossians. Verse three, chapter 3, verse number 1. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. <laughs> what kind of things should we be seeking? <laughs> what do you mean? Oh, we just, we just go up to heaven, we, we, we get these white robes, and we sit Indian style, and we just go, Home, Jesus loves us, home, Jesus loves us. That's what people think about heaven. Set your affections on things above. Well, I don't know anything about heaven. <laughs> well, you can't really set your affections on things that you know nothing about. You know, when we pray, our kids, before we go to bed every night, 
I find it interesting how they repeat a lot of things that I say. But many times they put their own little twist on it. They put their own little spin on it. I always say, you know, thank you so much for Jesus. Thank you for our eternal home in heaven. And then Chloe will say something like, help our house in heaven that it will have three stories and that Bailey is playing in there already, ready to hang out with us. You know, whatever she says, because she's a child, right? Her, her childlike understanding. But setting your affections on those things, when you do that early on with those younger children, you know, we're in a, we're in a day and age, so I'm telling you right now, okay? Paul says that in the, in the last days, perilous times shall come. They will call good evil. When they're, I mean, I saw this thing, I just saw this last night, and I was like, we're, we're screwed. I mean, this, it, it, they're, they're trying to degender Mr. Potato Head. I said, that's the most crazy thing I've ever heard in my entire life. What, what about Hasbro? Are we going to call it Has, I don't know, how has been i don't know i mean it's just so weird that is so weird that they were getting to that point remember as a child child children have no sexual identity they're a they're a child I don't teach my kid about sex he's eight years old he doesn't even know anything about that he's that, that's, that's not, that doesn't even go into his mindset why would you try to teach a child about oh yeah you can you can change well your gender is not your sex well, yes it is because here's the question how, 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 does a, how does a man change a tire versus a woman change a tire? The same exact way, right? They, they, they do almost everything the exact same. They, see, what they've done, and this is me just giving you a rant for a second, okay? Here, here's, here's the reality of what happened. You want to know the truth? Here's the truth, okay? In the very beginning, there was a curse placed upon both the man and the woman, okay? The curse upon the man is that, you know what? Good luck. Have fun getting the food out of the ground. Have fun eating. It's going to be a toil. And you're going to have to take care of your family. And then when you procreate, good luck. Maybe your wife survives. Maybe she doesn't. But it's going to be a turmoilous and very horrible experience to give childbirth. Now we've made it a little easier. And, you know, we can give epidurals and all these other things. But, I mean, you watch that epidural be done. You're like, what are you, whoa, what are you guys doing? You're jamming a needle into your spine? Oh, my goodness. Craziness, right? So what they do is to the woman they say, you know, and I will greatly multiply thy sorrow in conception, in childbirth, right? But it also says, and, to, and, 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 and your desire shall be to your husband, and he shall rule over thee. Now, oh, oh, that's such a horrible thing. That's a horrible thing, because they think, well, you rule over, you, you, you are so, such a fuddy-duddy, you can't say things like that. Well, let me, let me put it this way. What we've tried to do in society, meaning not we, but society as a, a general, has tried to make women men, and they've tried to make men women. And they're saying, they're interchangeable. You guys are the exact same in all aspects and all avenues and all areas. You ever heard something like, you know, um, th there, there's nothing like a mother's love? Women have a nurturing aspect to them because they nurture their children. That is impossible for a man to do. It is impossible for a man to feed a baby. But not, not in this society. We can pump it out. We can, you can feed that baby. And I don't have to take care of him. I know you're going to say things, people are going to get offended by it. What I'm saying by all those things is that society is trying to corrupt the, 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 the nature of how the process works. What is, your, what is the most fulfilling thing for a woman to do? I'll tell you right now. It's, it's the childbirth. It's the, it's the raising of the family. It's all of those pieces. They want to say, no, you should get a job, and you should try to be like a man. And if you're like a man, then you'll finally be happy. And then you're like, well, what am I? Well, none of us really happy. Listen, none of that stuff's ultimately make you happy. The only thing that's going to make you happy is, as Paul says, where is happiness found? How are you going to have all joy, peace, and hope in believing? It's going to get worse. I'm telling you right now. I had friends say, I don't want to have kids because I don't want to raise them in this society. Well, you know what? Generically, for such a time as this, right? I mean, come on. You can't say you're not going to do it because the society is so corrupt. We need more men and women. We need more individuals. Might as well raise up a little more of an army. Let's get a little more people because, as, as we've all been told by the scripture, we are at war, and it's never been more apparent in my entire life. I've never seen stuff like this. You know, the kid JoJo from D Disney. My kid's got Disney socks that are JoJo. I don't even know. Jo jo JoJo's like eight years old, and she's gay now. And I'm like, come on. Come on. I don't, I, I don't want to have to get into this. The kid's eight years old. Now you're sexualizing a child. You guys are the ones that are perverse, yeah, right? Yeah, right. You guys are the ones that are perverse. Don't talk to me about that. You guys are just worse than a pedophile. You guys are doing all this crazy nonsense. 
you know, I and mean, here's the problem. Nobody wants to speak about these things. Oh, this is, this is, this is controversial. Yeah, it's, the whole Bible is controversial. It's called the offense of the cross. So if you don't like it, then, I mean, as Russ always says, put in your pipe and smoke it. Because I'm, I'm done. I'm, I'm over it. I'll be very blunt about it. And if, and if I lose friendships over it, so be it. But I've told some of my buddies, I'm like, this is, this is perverse. This is messed up. We live in a really corrupt world, and it's not going to get any better. When they call evil good, then you know, right? Paul says also in that passage, he goes, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, right? Pretty interesting, because I'm seeing the churches do that all the time. Yeah, that's where it's at. The churches are, are saying they have a form of godliness, and then they're really denying the power thereof, and they don't even know the gospel. And then they're, they're going to be all, all along with it because they don't want to lose their nonprofit status. Guess what? If someone goes Bible Fellowship loses their nonprofit status tomorrow and we've got to pay taxes, who cares? I don't make any money anyways. <laughs> you know? Right? It doesn't matter. But they're all concerned about that. When you have an $11 million budget, you, you gotta, you, all of a sudden you've got to pay 30% taxes. All of a sudden, oh, that's, that's a big deal. Right? We're going to have to make you give extra because we've got to pay taxes now. Right? Fortunate world we live in, but all the more, standing up for righteousness should be a thing because, as Paul says, Yea, all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Suffer it. Deal with it. Try it out. See if you like it. I mean, this, I'm speaking this to myself as well. Because for me, I, I take it seriously. I, I really do think about the judgment seat every day. Right? And if every man's going to give an account of things done in his body, well, I'm probably going to spend some time thinking about how my ministry is going to benefit in, in the in the judgment seat. So if Paul says here, so everyone uh, that runs, you know, he, Paul says, I, therefore I run, verse 26, therefore so run, not as uncertainly. So fight I, not as one that beateth the air. That's the majority of, of the church in Christianity. That's the majority. They run, they have no idea what they're running to. They have no idea what they're doing. They have no clue. And it's, it's not that they uh, are... It's nothing other than their own laziness that got them there. But I was taught by so-and-so. <laughs> Who cares if you're taught by so-and-so? Do you have the Bible? Can you sit down there and read it for yourself? Yeah, you can. He says, but I keep under my body and bring it in subjection, lest by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. People have used that verse to say, see, God's just going to cast you away. No, what happens is this. If it, I forget how Russ said it one time. He says, should, the, should your life match the, the, the ministry? Yes, right? And if your life doesn't match the ministry, are people going to call you out on it? Yeah, <laughs> right? And they do. So here, the issue of being a castaway in relation to, to your service, yeah, you become a castaway, people are going to look at you and go, I'm not going to listen to anything you have to say. I don't want to even talk to you. That's, that's the context of this passage here. So getting back into Acts chapter number 15, or uh, 21, now we see a lot more about what Paul is doing here. He, he, he's, becoming, he's becoming a Jew. He's, he's putting himself under the law to try to gain them that are under the law because he cannot shake the years and decades that he spent with these people. The longer you spend with them, the longer you care about them, right? Were there ever a point in time it was there a point in time in which the Gentiles were instructed that they should be keeping some type of a feast? Funny enough, in, Act, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul actually says that yes, right? He talk, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. He, he does talk about the issue of the feast, and he says that we keep the feast. If you read in verse number, 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 8, Therefore let us keep the feast not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I've had somebody tell me that, yes, you are supposed to keep the feast, but we keep it this way. No, he's saying the whole concept of the feast here is what was the issue of the unleavened bread. It was an issue of what? A picture of, anybody got it? Separation and sanctification, right? That was the picture of it. So we should now keep it in sincerity and truth. In that verse in particular, he's talking about not to accompany those that are fornicators. And he says, not all together with fornicators, because you got to go out in the world and you got to be dealing with fornicators all day. Half the people I fish with are the most fornicating people I've ever met. They're just fornicators all day. They just fornicate. I mean, you might as well just call yourself the fornicators. You might as well call your fishing team that. I say it in jest, but it's, it's unbelievable that the society that we live in, they think nothing of it. I look at it and they look at me and go, you're a single guy. You can do whatever you want. I go, I don't do whatever I want. 
Uh, not good. Why? Because a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. In Acts chapter number 21, they're really mad because the pollution that occurs, they say that they brought into the temple and they polluted it. Remember that phrase? They brought the Greeks into the temple. Who did they probably bring in there? Well, there was guys like uh, um, in chapter 20, verse 4, you got uh, Asia Sopater of Berea, the Thessalonians Aristarchus and Secundus, Gaius of Derby and Timotheus and of Asia and Tychicus and Trophimus, right? So these are the guys they actually say in verse number 21 of Acts, or 29 of Acts chapter 21, for they had seen before with him in the city of Trophimus an Ephesian. Ooh, they brought an Ephesian whom they suppose that Paul had brought into the temple. Now, all of these verses, all the things that he does, what the, the, the phrase that I used last week that I wanted to really harp on was found in, in Romans chapter 15, okay? We're going to compare this last four or five minutes in Acts chapter 21 where he says that as touching the Gentiles which believe we have written and concluded that they observe no such thing and he gives a list of four things, right? Which is that they should say that they should uh, 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 save, uh, keep themselves from things offered idols, from blood, from strangled, and from fornication. Remember, he talks about those four things. But then over here in Romans chapter 15, and this is going to be our aha moment, and let's just get this, okay? Romans chapter 15. So this is right before, Romans 15 is written, you know, likely from Corinth, right? Right before he goes to Jerusalem. So in, Acts, in Romans chapter 15, you see here that he says in verse number... Uh, Try not to write, read all of this. Let's just get to um, let's read in verse number seventeen. I have therefore whereof I may glory through Jesus Christ in those things which pertain to God, for I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ hath not wrought by me to make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed. Now, in Paul's ministry, he's saying that there are things, and that definition of all things is where we will pick up next week and define what all of those things actually mean, but he says, all things, notice this, verse number 18, I will dare not speak to any of those things which Christ hath not wrought by me. Has Christ wrought other things by others that Paul was not going to deal with? In particular, let's, let's keep reading these verses because this is your aha moment. Ready? He says, through mighty signs. Let me read it again just so you get it. I have therefore whereof I may glory through Jesus Christ in those things which pertain to God. Can I just tell you that 45 minutes is not enough time? It, it's not even enough time. I need two hours to like even get my, and I know I can sit there for longer and try to pack it all in. And, and, but he says this. I have therefore whereof I may glory through Jesus Christ in those things which pertain to God. For I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ has not wrought by me to make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed. Through mighty signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about all of Elercrum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Yea, notice this, so have I strived to preach the gospel not where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation. Huh. Let me, let me read that to you again. Yea, so I have strived to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation. But he's going he's gonna to go to Jerusalem. Read verse number 30 of chapter 15. Now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake and for the love of the Spirit that you scribe together with me in your prayers to God for me, that I may be delivered from them that do not believe in Judea, and that my service which I have for Jerusalem may be accepted of the... Okay. This is really important because... <laughs> Earlier, Paul says that there were false brethren unawares brought in who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we had in Christ Jesus. Remember that? 
So now he's saying that there are, there's Jerusalem. They may be accepted of the, of the saints. I'm going to tell you right now, whatever he thinks that the saints are that are there, he says he's trying not to, he's striving not to preach the gospel where another man has preached it so that he doesn't build upon another man's foundation. Well, that's a twofold issue. It's not just about the judgment scene about foundation. The second issue is he doesn't want to build upon another's foundation because all of a sudden he starts preaching the gospel of the grace of God. He's going to confuse those people who have believed the gospel of the kingdom and they're going to be like, oh, I have no idea what's going on now. Now you're telling me this. This guy's telling me that. I got two separate things. You're telling me not to keep the law. You're telling me I'm supposed to walk orderly. You're telling me I'm supposed to be circumcised. These guys are saying I'm not and they're going to be all over the place, right? Now, if he's going to you know, go to have a ministry for Jerusalem, right? And then it might be accepted. Why go? Well, as I said before, because I really, you're going to see they're false brethren. When Paul finally, we're going to finish with this. When Paul finally gets in there and he, he says all the things he says, they say off of this head, we're going to kill him. All the crowd riles up. They all get together. And what do, what do they do? Does, does a single person that is in Jerusalem stand up for Paul? Does a single one in Acts chapter 22? I, I just want to see, was there one person who stood and said with Paul, you know what Paul says? They all forsook me. They all forsook me. Where's Trophimus? Where, where's Luke? Where's, where's Timothy? Where are these guys in Acts chapter 22? They see that crowd. They know, well, listen, if we're all dead and we're all captured... It's not going to be good for the gospel. We've got to get out of here, right? So in Acts chapter 22, even James himself doesn't stand up and defend the Apostle Paul. Why is that? And that's what we're going to answer next week, and we will be defining in more detail what he means by all things, or all the things that he says, I will not make the Gentiles obedient to these things. Things is a nondescript thing to describe a noun, right? So what are these things? You know, I don't like when somebody says a thing. No, we'll say things. I'm like, what are you talking about? The thing, the thing, the thing, the thing. I don't know what that means. When we go fishing all the time, somebody says thing, and I'm like, what? the thing doesn't work. I'm like, what is it? The thing, the, the, it looks like a black thing with the little piece and the roller. The release clip? Yeah, the release clip. For the trolling rod? Yeah, the trolling rod. Okay. You know, like, I know what it is. They don't know the, the terminology. Um, but thing is just a word that they throw out there. But I want to define those things because it is defined in the scripture. And sorry, but we have to stop. We'll pick up here next week. All right, let's go to prayer. Dear Lord Jesus.